Thank you again to Telephone Canada for presenting this session and the close-up series. And with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel. First, we have Pietro Galliano. Pietro is the founder of the Toronto-based entertainment innovation studio, Transitional Forms, built on his commitment to the notion that storytelling has the power to create a hopeful future in a post-singularity world. Pietro's work has been recognized through hundreds of awards and nominations, including two Emmy Awards, 11 Canadian Screen Awards, 31 FWAs, and many more. And speaking with Pietro today is our moderator, Ramona Pringle. Ramona is the director of the Creative Schools Innovation Studio and an associate professor in the RTA School of Media. A writer, creator, researcher, and journalist, Ramona produces work for a broad range of platforms and experiences with a focus on the evolving relationship between humans and technology. Thank you so much for being here and welcome. Hi, thank you so much. So happy to be here and chatting with you, Pietro. Yeah, happy to be here too. Thanks, Ramona. Thanks for having me. So I guess we'll just uh, jump right in. This is such a well, such a fascinating and rich area to talk about, such a relatively new one, and you in particular are doing such interesting work. So I'm very excited for today's conversation. Uh, and even though AI really is all around us, I do still think it's very much shrouded in mystery and perceived as having a lot of barriers to entry. Uh, so before we get into some of the nuts and bolts of who's using it right now, definitely we're going to get into how you're using it. Uh, and I also want to talk about how filmmakers might use it because I think that's why everyone is watching. Uh, let's start with the very basics. What is artificial intelligence? Sure. Uh, so I should I should be clear that I'm not um, an expert in answering that question because I, I maybe we'll get into this later. But my background is is uh, highly creative. Um, um, I don't have a I'm not an engineer. Don't have a computer science degree. But the way that I uh, look at artificial intelligence is is kind of in in two categories. There's an old style of artificial intelligence that was very much um, heuristic and and um, about behavior trees, if this, then that. And the new type of artificial intelligence, the new wave is about um, neural networks and allowing machines to learn for themselves. So basically, I would categorize artificial intelligence as uh, the way that machines can make their own decisions. And what about in the context of content creation and filmmaking um, and creative work? Yeah, for sure. Um, so that is um, obviously what I'm fascinated by is is whether machines can be creative or or not. And I think um, you know four or five years ago when I started Transforms, um, you would Google creative machine intelligence and there would be sparse results. And you know there's a lot of debate back then whether machines could be quote unquote creative or not. But um, now I think there's no debate. We're seeing machines being creative in all sorts of ways and uh, you know beyond affecting almost every industry on earth, uh, the creative industry is going to be uh, impacted uh, heavily by this in, in exciting ways. Um, I think that artists and, and filmmakers and creatives will be leaning on these intelligent systems to um, uh, as fuel to the fire for their creative work for years to come. I, I, I agree. Uh, I also, I think that these conversations can tend to be very conceptual because it is very much the frontier that we're on. And I think what's so exciting about today's panel and having or conversation, having you here is that we have some concrete examples to, to use as a jumping off point to break apart. Uh, I know that you've got a clip to show. So I think um, we can look a little bit at the story behind agents, agents, I know we were telling us that wherever you go, people uh, people um, use their native yeah um, pronounce it as you will yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but let's take a look, and then I think we can start uh, pulling it apart from there. The experience opens with an origin story of small intelligent creatures called the agents who live on a barren, floating planet. Gravity goes straight down in this world, so the agents need to balance and counterbalance with each other. Cooperating to survive. Until you show up with the power to change their existence forever. Cooperating. 
We've stayed clear from clunky UI or complex interfaces so that it's just you, the planet, and the agents. The audience can pick up these little creatures, throw them if you want, but please be nice, or rotate the sky to change their point of view. We built a number of custom systems controlling things like agent attention and emotion, the musical score, and even dynamic cameras for generative cinematic moments. So that each version of the film unfolds uniquely and just for you. But the most important interaction is planting magical flowers that, being film nerds, we nickname MacGuffins. It's an old that, that's a MacGuffin. Because they are the catalyst that changes everything. Love, loss, discovery, betrayal, death and rebirth are all possible stories that can manifest on each planet in our simulated universe. But it's up to you to choose to plant the flower or not. The stars of this experience are cute little agents powered by game AI, or heuristic functions and state machines that tell them what to do, which makes them super fun to watch and interact with. But here's the cool innovation part. In our pause menu is a feature to swap their little brains with something far more interesting, neural networks. So instead of just doing what they're told by their programming, these little creatures are capable of thinking and acting for themselves. Okay, so you start to get into some of this in the clip and explain some of this in the clip, but can you recap? Uh, for starters, this is both about AI and using AI. How have you used artificial intelligence? And, and also what was your goal? Sure, yeah. So um, um, as I kind of mentioned before, um, there, there are two types of AI in this film. There's um, uh, what we were calling game AI, where um, if you imagine like a giant decision tree that maps out if if the agent encounters this, then they'll do that. If this happens, then that will happen. Um, so that uh, that uh, drove the behavior of um, of some of the creatures in the film. But then we also used uh, you know, an emergent uh, technology called reinforcement learning, um, and which is very popular in the AI industry for teaching machines how to make their own decisions. So, um, so some of the uh, creatures you could turn on that aspect of their behavior, and that meant that they could uh, uh, decide on their own based on how they've they've trained in the environment before. Um, and that that I think was the most interesting part about the film is that these these creatures you know, you don't necessarily know what they're going to do next. And that um, made the film different with every viewing. Now you, um, I think were quite modest off the top in terms of your uh, knowledge or sort of not, you know, not being a computer scientist, but you do have a, you know, rich and impressive background in using technology for storytelling and content creation. There are filmmakers present watching who are going to stream the recording. And I think a lot of people might think that this is a sandbox that only computer scientists or technologists can play in. What skills would you say that you need to have if people are curious to start playing in this space? It's fascinating to me that we're talking about this as a film today, because I feel like for the last decade and a half, we probably would have talked about it as interactive something or other, but it's a very, I think, bold step to say, film, AI, smushing it all together. And I love it because I think it does open up um, the sandbox for others to play. So um, tell us who can play, tell us what skills you need to have. For sure, yeah. Like my my skill set um, in particular does come from interactive storytelling and nonlinear narratives. Um, I was um, one of the co-founders of Secret Location before starting Transitional Forms, um, and um, certainly that's my core skill set as a as a creative director. But um, I think the one thing that um, I brought to this project was uh, convincing people to do it, <laughs> you know, like um, partnering up with the NFB. For, first of all, um, they were, they were, yes, they brought yes and energy to this from, from the beginning. So ha being able to partner with an institution like, like the NFB um, was an honor and they were, they were just like, 
awesome. We love this. Let's see, let's see if it's possible. And then, um, and then building a team around it, uh, who, who actually had the, you know, skill set in, in artificial intelligence and, and computer uh, science and engineering and art and creative and, and production. Like that was, uh, that was what was absolutely needed to, to pull this off. So um, beyond my background in, you know, interactive storytelling. I think it was <laughs> just convincing people that maybe this is possible. You know, it's so interesting. It's such a great um, tangible example. It's something that we talk a lot about at the university and in the creative school. Uh, every year, the World Economic Forum updates its list of the necessary skills or the top skills right now and in the decade to come. And it's always, or it's, it's evolving more and more into creative thinking, complex problem solving, human skills, the ability to get people on board. I think curiosity is a huge one. That's not necessarily on the list as such, but just that very much is that yes and energy of like, what can we do with this? How do we do it? How do we get that team? So that is something that you talk about. I mean, these, these projects don't happen with only us storytellers, curious people, researchers. Um, let's, Talk a little bit about what other skills there are in the making of a project like this. So what did the team look like on this project? Who were you working alongside? Um, and what does that workflow look like? Because it's not necessarily the same as on a traditional film. Yeah, so I, I would say the um, the closest comparison would be uh, to um, making a video game. Like um, the, the type of uh, makeup on the team was very much like uh creative technologists um you know uh shout out to to our team dante nick uh casey like uh these people were part of the project from the beginning who just wore many hats all the way through to to make it possible um so yeah i, I think that like you need the the traditional like technologist art director type uh roles producer um but that in a project like this that's so innovative the key key to the process is just to be iterative so you're mm -hmm. constantly testing making hypothesis testing them seeing if you you're you know you were correct or if, if you failed and then hopefully failing fast and bouncing back quickly and we we went through many iterations of, of this film um and we were you know tweaking it right right until the end to try to maximize the possibilities of the the, the dy dynamic output and for people who don't know Dante and Nick, I don't know them. What were they doing? <laughs> like, what are the kinds of roles that the rest of the team was was working on? Sure. Yeah. So, um, uh, uh, technologist Dante was our, our uh, lead technologist um, on the project. So he had a background in artificial intelligence, but he's um, uh, incredible at um, uh, Unity and, and game engine and, and uh, game design, that type of thing. So, uh, and Nick uh, uh, on the other side uh, represented the art. Every single pixel that came out of that experience was was by Nick's hand. But at the same time, the blend of those two uh, for in particular was was incredible because Nick was diving into the technology side and Dante's diving into the creative side and I think that's just part of our DNA at, at Transforms is we try to hire people that will you know wear a certain hat and we know that that's covered in the company but you know the more blending of creative and technology that we have the better for every project. Uh, I think that's so right on. It's always been my experience too. When you're doing a project that is not following a form or a map that's existed before, the best teams are the ones where no one ever says, that's not my job, because there's always a little bit of dabbling and a little bit of picking up and there is that blurring. And I think there is just that desire and drive to say, okay, we're charting something new. And exactly. Interdisciplinarity we... can be a mm -hmm. skill. Yeah. I also just love how much this is, uh, hopefully encouraging to people who you know don't necessarily see themselves as technologists as a path that they can pursue something that more and more of us can can be doing there's another piece to this though when we talk about the team and when we talk about creation because there's the humans involved but there's also ai and this is a fundamental uh change i mean i know you think about it the same way and i've heard you talk about it the same way in terms of what a fundamental turning point this can be for humanity for content creation for storytelling but it's very different even the very impressive technologies that exist uh for content creation photoshop final cut they're starting to integrate ai into their uh, workflows as well 
but what's different than, you know, editing software, let's say, is that AI almost becomes a collaborator. And I know you've got a lot of thoughts on that. So I think um, that's another really fascinating piece to this is you've got the humans you're collaborating with, but then you've also got the AI, which is active, right? Yeah, that's right. And it like um, you asked about goals earlier, and, and certainly one of the goals of this project was to prove that three-way authorship, this idea of three-way authorship is possible. And that means that, you know, our team as, uh, you know, one level of authorship creates this world that, you know, certain things can happen and there's a certain number of dynamic possibilities or hopefully infinite number of dynamic possibilities within that world. Um, and then the user has agency to push and pull that uh, as they please. But then there's this third author as artificial intelligence that lives within the world and is making making its own decisions to um, affect the narrative that unfolds. So um, yeah, when you talk about like, you know, the possibilities of, of creativity, I think that we need to, especially with the excitement of like the metaverse and these like dream worlds and, you know, cultures imagining these possibilities right now, I think that AI will play a key role as, you know, arguably the third author in, uh, in how a lot of these uh, pieces of entertainment unfold. I do think one of the hardest parts isn't the technology itself, but the letting go, uh, especially for storytellers, for content creators, there's a desire to make things perfect, to tell the story the perfect way, to trigger emotions at the perfect time. How do you think your background and participatory content and thinking about audience engagement and interactivity, how did that prep you? Do you think that it made it easier for you to kind of hand over a little bit of the agency to AI in this process? For sure. I, I obsess a little too much over the storytelling aspects of this um, with with respect to that. Like, I think that it's, um, there are so many storytelling frameworks that exist that we studied to to put this film together and um and that uh, uh you know have been woven into our other uh um projects as well so it's like to me if you can lean on some kind of cuz humans are storytellers we're we're storytelling machines that's how we understand the world and like on a higher level i i hope that the storytelling um is where humans and ai will will one day overlap and understand each other but um I, I think that it's about creating walls around the sandbox that people can play in but knowing that you're relying on some kind of storytelling framework whether it's beginning middle and end or story circle or whatever it is that um guarantees an experience that's going to be emotionally engaging over time oh i so i i <laughs> I just feel like my brain is branching path right now. I don't know where to go next. You talked about sandbox walls though. And I think that's a really interesting one because when you've got an AI and when you've got audience involvement, you've also got the capacity for things to go in directions that you didn't anticipate. Um, and, you know, we've seen time after time now that people have the desire to break systems, especially with new technology, they want to see how far they can push things. So it's not always the ideal scenario of how you think an audience is going to engage, which is how they, you know, actually end up engaging. One of the uh, infamous examples is the chat bot that Microsoft made named Tay that lived on Twitter. And within 24 hours, she was designed to be, or she, it was designed to be kind of a teenage girl persona, but within 24 hours, people had pushed this bot to be spewing racist and homophobic and sexist content. So what considerations have you taken into account when you think about the sandbox, when you think about the space that you're creating for these different personalities and forms and technologies to interact? Sure. Yeah. So that was one of the um, really interesting learning experiences on agents was um, just putting someone in a world with these creatures meant that they could do whatever, you know, and we could only anticipate so many different branching storylines. And the, the the walls around that sandbox were, you know, arguably simplified and limited. But even when my mom went into the experience, she she uncovered a new storyline that I never anticipated. You know, um, she just would 
move them around and talk to them and play with them. And it, the story kind of didn't unfold uh, after that. Um, or she was just in there for like, you know, 40 minutes doing that. Um, but some people would go in, throw them all off right away and, uh, uh, you know, and then move on to the next planet and try again. Um, but when it comes to like the Tay example that you gave Ramona, I think that that's like a really important thing that's happening in culture right now where, you know, if, if, you know, companies like Microsoft are willing to take the risk and put themselves out there and do that, um, I, I think that um, we should anticipate that that culture and audiences are going to try to break it. And maybe they didn't anticipate to that level that, you know, that here's this learning machine that's publicly going to uh, learn from what people are saying. And and, and it, it turned, you know, horrible, <laughs> discriminatory. Um, I, I think that um, there are bigger that that's a big problem and i'm not thinking saying that it's a solved problem but a company like ours can uh lean on larger companies and say you know there are certain filters and certain parameters that that um can be uh uh, uh brought to the ai and and certain that certain ones that won't and that will be blocked um and we want to create content where uh, we encourage culture to play with this type of technology and and almost have to um, anticipate that they're going to break it. Um, our new some of our new projects uh, put um, put the AI right in the palm of uh, the training of the AI in the palm of uh, the hands of the user and um, and others you know are trying to create uh, scenarios where we encourage glitches and we encourage that 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 um, uh, uh, surprising behavior and we celebrate it. And we're definitely going to get into that in a little bit. Um, but first, you know, you were talking a little bit about some of the user experiences, your mom's experience, which I love hearing about. A huge part of Edge Agents is the open sourcing and collaboration that goes into machine learning and teaching these agents the different behaviors. So tell us a little bit with this particular project before we get into the next one or next ones. Um, what were some of the most interesting learned behaviors that you observed in your agents and in this project? Yeah, so you know the the I think we only scratched the surface to be honest with with agents. the the creatures that are in there um, had to learn complex behavior just to survive on the planet and and just just to get like, you know they're they're arguably no more intelligent than than insects uh right now and we had this these big ambitions to like you know constantly train agents and update the film with them and, and truth be told we didn't do that we got we got to the point where we could get reinforcement learning agents in the film survive on the planet come up with some um novel behavior um my favorite uh, of of that is that um uh, two of them kind of rely on each other, which I wasn't expecting. I thought they'd all kind of fend for themselves, but there's two of them that kind of, um, in order to survive and balance, there's two that kind of always come together and and kind of find each other. I like to think that they're in love. Um, maybe it's uh, codependence or something like that. But um, yeah, that that there there were certainly surprising behaviors as we trained these agents. We'd come into the office the next day and and find one just running on the top of the planet, and you know everyone would laugh like this one's been there for like four hours doing this um but uh we didn't get as far as we wanted to uh on that film one of our goals was just to prove that the concept uh, could exist but what it did unlock is um a new project which we codenamed animo um and we're uh we're in the midst of rebranding it now um with a new name but uh essentially we want um people to within the game itself it's a it's a desktop game and within the game itself you'll be able to train behaviors whatever you want um through the mechanism of 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 love and fear or likes and dislikes with things in the environment um so we're letting uh, users train these little learning machines to do whatever they want them to do in this world. And that's, that's certainly the biggest thing that came out of agents was, um, the, not only the concept, but the know-how to pull a game like that off that we, we think that there's no other game like that. I also love that you've made them, you know, just hearing you talk about them being in love. I love that you made them so cute and not scary and not, um, you know, looming large. It is a it's a very lovely and endearing model of AI. And I think if it comes to us training them, there is something that it triggers that's very nurturing. Or hopefully that would be the case. 
Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Nurturing <laughs> was one of the the key words that we kept coming back to and, and empathizing, mm-hmm. um, you know, experiences like this, where you can share space with, with an artificially intelligent creature just allows you to, you know, we, we may, we may, um, uh, rightly or wrongly humanize them. Um, but it is about creating empathy for these creatures that arguably didn't ask to exist in the first place and were responsible for their creation. So we, we should start empathizing with them. Now you have very much, you know, going back to the beginning of this conversation, your work is both using AI and about AI. Um, but we're also seeing AI, as I said, off the top, integrated into almost every aspect of our lives to streamline things. Often we don't even know that it's there. So many of the softwares that the filmmaking community uses are becoming smarter and smarter and using these technologies. One of the big fears that people have across industries, one of the big concerns is about um, being displaced, right? What happens to jobs in the face of AI and these new technologies? So, and this is probably, you know, when people read about AI and filmmaking in a panel, it's probably one of the questions that a lot of people come with is the impact that AI will have on jobs within this industry in particular. How do you see that? I know I have a lot of opinions, which I'll share maybe after also a lot of thoughts, but how do you see um, that other side or those other applications of AI f- affecting the filmmaking community and, and people's livelihoods. Sure. Yeah. And I'd love to hear your, your opinions <laughs> uh, too, because there's no one right answer on this. Um, personally, I um, am, I, I celebrate the tech. I celebrate the creative possibilities that the tech gives us. Um, I think that if you're, <laughs> this, is a, this is a harsh thing to say, but if you're, at working a job that can be automated, you're probably not happy anyways. You're not being artistic. So if, if, you, if you want to be an artist, jump on board, start using this technology to create brand new things. And as it, as it relates to the, um, you know, film industry in particular, any industry, you know, I don't know. The, it's a paradigm shift. The the there there will be different jobs. There will be different opportunities. There'll be different roles as an artist that will emerge from this that we can't really see the other side of right now. Um, again, it, it's a it's an optimistic uh, uh, perspective. But you know, butcher baker, candlestick maker. There's candlesticks. <laughs> candle making is still a multi billion dollar industry worldwide. You know, there are certain things that that won't go away. But as a filmmaker or anyone involved in filmmaking, for example, um, if, if you think about it this way, you you might have a role on a film. You're you're the director, you're the writer, or you're the, you know, the, the um, uh, uh, you score the film. Imagine having the power where you're not just scoring the film, you're not just writing the film, but you can engage with artificial intelligence to create the whole experience. Like that's the world that we're um, entering into. And not to say that, you know, this should kill collaboration or, or teams or anything like that. It becomes even powerful if humans are collaborating on this stuff. But like the, the fact that you don't need a giant team to create this content and you could partner with artificial intelligence to create whatever your imagination can come up with is like, that's a powerful idea that I think that artists everywhere should be leaning into. Absolutely. And if anything, you know, maybe it can take over some of the more rote tasks. That is where computers really excel is the things that maybe are a little bit boring, that are very time consuming of sorting, let's say through footage, making, you know, you need that shot, that close up, let a computer find it instead of having someone scrub through footage for, you know, even if they're fast forwarding, as long as that ends up taking. And so I think it's some of those more junior positions, some of those more repetitive positions that I think are the ones that may be first lost, but it also opens up to more creative roles. And we've seen time and again that jobs get lost, new jobs get made. It's been fascinating to me, you know, um, every time there ha- is a news release about jobs being lost and these they you know sometimes the titles on these reports is like tidal wave of automation i think the tidal wave was language that came from forest or a couple years ago 2017 or so or 2018 um but the kind of the the tagline the follow-up to massive job loss is also that there's actually going to be more new jobs that come and that the balance is going to go you know the, the the scales tip in the favor of new jobs but it does require 
lifelong learning. It does require that curiosity we were talking about before. So I think in terms of the job, in the kind of job market and industry market, things change. Um, ultimately, it's not all bad news. It's not bad news at all, but it does mean for some people that there is learning and work that needs to take place and things may not look the same as they did before. Certainly, you know, teaching university classes, it's a fascinating moment in time right now because I think often AI is still thought about in terms of some of our quote unquote technology classes, uh, the interactive storytelling classes, a lot of the stuff that I tend to teach. But I think, you know, the trajectory of technology is that the last 10 years don't prepare us for the speed of change over the next 10. It's more like the next two. And very, very soon, it's going to be essential for anyone going through school to have these skills as well. Um, because certainly on our phones, I mean, our phones, every app that you open right now is filters and AI. So uh, we're both very, very well equipped. But sometimes don't necessarily realize that it takes a little bit of getting under the getting under the hood. Um, Anyway, I'll ask more questions. <laughs> uh, another worry, there's the sort of job aspect of this. You've talked quite a bit about this, but the the role of the director, um, because this is another concern that maybe someone have when it comes to AI or machines working creatively is what is the role of the filmmaker? And so, you know, what is the creative process for you, the director, when you are working with so many collaborators, human and machine collaborators? I know you talked about how you maybe want to control the story more than you ought to, or you, or maybe you just want to control the story. But um, what does it mean to be a director when there's so many different uh, forces that are um, impacting what you're doing? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I'll go back a little bit in my career when um, um, I was doing more uh, nonlinear uh, experiences and those were fun to, to make. And it was always a, a, a tremendous uh, job in, say, the writer's room or the planning process to say, we want this uh, narrative to branch in all these different directions. And to like, you know, the, the Bandersnatch is, is uh, not a piece that I've worked on, I wish, but um, that's a perfect example of these like branching, choose your own adventure narratives that um, we were experimenting with back in the day at Secret Location. And I, I loved working on those projects. Um, and they, it was a lot of planning and writing and thinking through, well, if the user chooses this, then how do we loop them back around to do that? Um, uh, the point that I'm trying to make, though, is that naturally, I think that in, in any of those uh, scenarios, you, you're kind of trying to force your favorite story. You're kind of still, even though there's all these different interactive possibilities, you're still kind of leaning on your favorite and trying to trying to tell a, a particularly interesting uh, version. Um, but when it comes to um, a director where you have AI involved as a co-author, um, it's, it's kind of different where you have to surrender to this thing that could decide to take it off the rails and you need to celebrate that. And so I think it's more like, you know, artists or directors in the future are about creating scenarios and um, engineering prompts, which we see a lot happening right now in, um, you know, generative images and, and, and that type of thing. And you're, again, it's about building this sandbox and saying, these are the walls around the sandbox. Anything can happen in here. Um, and, and, you know, I need to celebrate that and I need to be, it's about surprise and delight, like, um, kind of the feeling when you, uh, watch, um, improv or like, a this old example, I don't know if this show's still on, but who, whose line is it anyways, where there's, um, you know, someone who's listening, curating ideas from the audience and giving an example. And then you see these humans improv it. And there's this beautiful surprise and delight where it's unfolding in the moment. I think that the role of a director will be that in the future where it's uh, about curating the possibilities and then letting the audience and the AI, you know, um, unfold them, but, you know, in real time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A little bit like people who direct live shows, award shows, sports games mixed with someone who understands narrative. Uh, it's very cool. Uh, exactly, I know there's questions yeah. that are starting to come in. There's some interesting ones talking about, uh, there's an interesting one here about also performers and jobs and roles. But before we get to that, just based on what you were just talking about and whose line is it anyway, you've got another interesting project um, 
called Being Cancelled, which is maybe the best title that I've heard in recent memory. <laughs> it's so great. Thanks. Um, Thank you. Let's, uh, let's, can we, I know you've got a clip for it too. Let's just chat a little bit about it, this, because I think there's more fuel for the fire and then we'll get to questions in a couple of minutes. At Transitional Forums, we believe content is quickly evolving to become more interactive, generative, and hyper-personalized. For example, the future of television will soon allow audiences to play with, influence, and regenerate their favorite shows as they unfold and evolve for them in real time. And of course, by soon, we actually mean now. Our team has developed a generative reality show called Being Cancelled, where the show's characters, director, and live audience are intertwined in a three-way authorship with generative AI. You're adopted. Surprise, everybody. It's Sarah's birthday. <laughs> the show plot can be transformed live as the content continuously generates in real time. We are the slave drivers working for the human scripts. Powering this innovation is our Transforms TV platform that allows for human input, autonomous script generation, real-time effects, and even dynamic scene assembly. We've already tested the system with a number of guest directors, and it's been amazing to see different people from all sorts of backgrounds interacting with sophisticated AI in such a culturally relevant way. I had a blast. I love that you can throw at me. Oh my god, this is so fun. Super fun. It was really fun. This was a lot of fun. This was really fun. I would do this literally for 24 hours straight if I could. <laughs> Even from these early streaming tests, we can confidently say this new format is super fun, wildly mesmerizing, and everyone f***ing loves it. Just wait till you try launching food from our chat feed. We've recently added a new bot feature that can stream endless amounts of novel content autonomously, and we'll soon have more interactions for the audience to directly generate the show itself. And of course, these new innovation features are unlocking a ton of possibilities for our platform. Generative ads, interactive game shows, murder mysteries, party games, cheesy horror comedies, the sky's the limit for what this tech can do. You can follow along with our developments as we regularly stream on Twitch. And of course, for more information on how we're merging the worlds of entertainment and machine intelligence, please visit, join, follow, or email us at transforms.ai. So cool. I can't wait. I hope I get an invitation to play with this really soon. Um, where Absolutely. Do you it's coming your way. Thank you. Um, where do you see this? living like what is the experience within the um landscape that we know of like you know over the top and online and streaming and quote unquote tv and film like where does this live in that whole uh ecosystem sure so um it's uh, that's a interesting question and and we're, we're figuring that out T truth be told this is the 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 time that we live in where we're trying to blend the content creation, especially generative, live, dynamic content, and the the tools that make the content or the technology that powers it. So um, there are kind of two parts to this. Um, on one side, we have the live stream um, that will be on uh, Twitch or YouTube or a combination of uh, popular live stream uh, channels. And the audience will tune in and be able to uh, affect the show, vote on what happens next, um, you know, change the narrative of the show live in real time. But then also we've got a side where um, uh, users will, or audience members will be invited to make a being like um, uh, these these virtual beings, obviously it's called being canceled, uh, and and on the show they'll 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 compete for entertainment value and some of them will be canceled at the end of every broadcast, um, but then audiences will be invited on the other side to create the beings and um and give them backstories and design what they look like and then uh you know lucky ones will be invited on the show to compete so we're trying to create this like uh push and pull between the pro uh the uh content and the platform and um involve the audience in both sides of that creation cool uh so last question before we go to audience questions um, if someone's interested in learning more about this technology and the opportunities that exist, where should they turn? What, what's out there? Where, where would you suggest people go as a first step or next step? Sure. Yeah. I, I'm, um, I'm a big fan of, uh, two minute papers on YouTube. Um, uh, 
I like the uh, the Lex Friedman podcast when when it comes to just just general like artificial intelligence um, discussions. Uh, there's lots of creative AI stuff on Reddit and Twitter. Um, you can use free tools right now to generate images like Crayon or Midjourney or Wombo, um, or sign up for OpenAI's uh, um, beta test for uh, Dali two. Um, Google has uh, uh, music tools. There's some free music tools that Google Magenta is uh, is available for anyone to use. GPT-3 is a language model that anyone can access now. Um, so there's lots of free stuff um, to play with. Uh, and also, like, I would encourage people to um, look for, like, introduction to artificial intelligence classes. Like, uh, I took one, um, I think it's still free, uh, from Udacity. Uh, Peter Norvig and Sebastian Toon um, do a great uh, intro to AI course there. Um, and also, like, a shameless plug, uh, go to transforms.ai, click on our contact, and we've got all kinds of social links, including our Discord channel that people can join. And we try to, you know, do some behind the scenes and sneak peeks on stuff that we're working on. Cool. Um, so it's 1245 now. Um, what, why, why don't we look at some of the questions that are here? So there's one question, how would this impact performers in the sense that an AI could be developed to perform a role that would have gone to a human in the past? That's an awesome question. And it's on the other side of this paradigm shift that I think we're, we're talking about. I think that when it comes to performance let's imagine the metaverse for a second and that you now can enter an experience whether you're performing for an audience or whether you're just performing in this experience i think that it gives the opportunity where anyone is a performer um and anyone can be the star anyone can be acting in in their own story um so again it's on the other side of a, a paradigm shift but i i think that it, it's um it's not about um, worrying that there isn't a role for human performers and that it's actually empowering the possibility that anyone can be a, a, a performer in these experiences. Totally. I think it's a, it's a bigger sandbox. We've got virtual backgrounds and we've seen for a long time people engaging with animated uh, entities on screen, virtual entities on screen. So I think it's just more creative opportunities to play. Uh, here's another question. I think we sort of touched on this, but uh, it's such a fascinating one. It's definitely, I think, the heart and the meat of what you've been working on. What were some of the most interesting learned behaviors you observed in agents? Well, um, yeah, we touched on this before, uh, and a, a lot of them didn't get into the the uh, final film. But um, as the team was experimenting with, uh, you know, training the agents early on, we would uh, nickname the the agents' uh, behavior. Like um, there was uh, moments of like betrayal, or uh, some of them would would t team up on another one, or um, like uh, we called one playing chicken. Um, there was one where they just started to dance uh, together and kind of make a make a circle on the top of the planet. So um, yeah, those were those were interesting. We kind of nicknamed them and again like humanized these behaviors. But um, there's so many different things that came out. Uh, but it was a tremendous uh, technical task to just get them to understand or or to to survive on the top of this planet because it was a very complex environment that we built and we found that out afterwards that we should have maybe created a simpler environment for them to learn on um but yeah those are some those are some examples of some interesting behaviors that came out of training them wonderful thank you so much um Rhiannon uh, maybe back over to you and the Academy. Thank you so much, Pietro. This has been so interesting. I have more questions, but I know it's lunchtime and it's time to wrap up. So thank you. And thank you to the Academy for letting us have this great conversation. And hopefully we get to chat more. Um, and I will share my experiences when I get to be director of this, which I'm very excited for. <laughs> uh, Rhiannon, thank you. Yeah, thank you both so much. Uh, such an enlightening conversation. Um, thank you for shedding some uh, really hopeful light on this subject. I think, you know, a lot of us are 
on the beginning of that learning curve. So this was really great. Uh, so thank you to Pietro and Ramona. And thank you again to our partners at Telephone Canada for presenting this session.